It's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, the conference theme, for those of you who, who may not recall, is cultural diversity at the intersection of mental health and the law. Uh, so this first speaker, our first speaker, Dr. Reese Tapsell from New Zealand, is a particularly fitting and appropriate uh, selection. We were delighted that he was willing to travel all the way here to come speak to us today. I have a really long bio on him that he's asked me not to read all of because uh, I want to leave a little time for him to talk too. Uh, so I'm going to summarize this very succinctly, but uh, Dr. Tapsell is of Maori heralding from the Arawa Canoe and of Nati Fakawi descent. How did I do? Pretty close, I hope, but I'm sure not accurate. Um, I'm not going to give you any more introduction than that, other than he's a very well-known forensic psychiatrist uh, and works in both clinical and forensic capacities, now as administrator as well. Uh, and, and I'm going to let him speak for himself beyond that. So please welcome Dr. Reese Tapsell. Uh, yes, thank you, Barry, and thank you, Anne, uh, for looking after me while I've been here. Um, I have to say I feel like a little bit of an imposter because although I did work in forensic psychiatry for quite a long time, uh, I'm not now principally employed as a forensic psychiatrist, but I do feel as though coming back among you, it's a bit like coming back into the fold, being a part of the wider uh, forensic family. So thank you for the welcome and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, some things that we've been doing in New Zealand and some things that we would like to think uh, might help some of our thinking in terms of how we might address, address the issues for Indigenous people. I might just, um, if you'd allow me, briefly break into my own language because my ancestors wouldn't forgive me if I didn't uh, acknowledge all of you and acknowledge all of the importance uh, of this event. Kia koutou, kia tātou uh, ngā kānohi ora, kia koutou te haukainga, uh, te mana whenua o tēnei wahi, te Alan Quinn. Uh, koe nei ngā mihi, kia koutou mō rātou, manaki te aki hoki kia mātou mō tō tātou nei uh, hui i te rā nei. Nā reira kia rātou, tēnā rā tātou. Uh, so, that was just briefly acknowledging those that have gone before us, those that have established in some ways the bedrock on which we all uh, do what we do. Also acknowledging, of course, the Indigenous people uh, of this land who have allowed us to meet today uh, and to explore and discuss the things uh, that we will. So you'll have seen that that's the title that I gave the organising committee. Um, this, though, is the title that uh, I prefer. The idea of cel celebrating the beauty and the opportunity that Indigeneity uh, provides, and I'm going to speak for a little bit about uh, how I think some of traditional knowledge systems, traditional life, traditional approaches to life can perhaps assist us uh, in the challenges that we have of helping uh, marginalised people do better in their lives. A series of acknowledgements firstly, of course, of course the people of this land and as I've earlier said, those people that have gone before us. Uh, and the organising committee to Barry, to Anne, uh, and to all of the committee that have clearly done such a lot of work. Equally though, uh, the people that have both supported and allowed me to do the work that I'm about to talk to you about, or those of us that did it as a group. Um, and in particular, Dr David Shaplow, who may be known to some of you, Dr Sandy Simpson, and Dr uh, Jeremy Skipworth, both of whom are in uh, the audience today. And then a series of Māori without whom it would have been impossible to have done any, any of what I'm about to talk to you about now. So where is New Zealand? For those of you that... How many people have been to New Zealand, by the way? OK, so there's a reasonable number of people. It's, I appreciate, quite a long way from here. Um, it is a, a country made up of three islands that spans a couple of degrees of latitude, temperate climate, um, 
And that's largely uh, the nature of New Zealand. We are a constitutional monarchy and we're made up of about four and a half, nearly five million people. And in particular, uh, out of that slide, the bit that I would like you to take is that Māori make up about 15% uh, of that general population. It would be remiss of me not to show you a couple of uh, tourist slides, so for those of you that haven't had an opportunity yet to get to New Zealand, this is your opportunity to now decide that you should go. Uh, it is a beautiful country, those of us living in it and those that visit uh, describe it in that way, um, and not unlike Canada in many ways, minus the snow. <laughs> As you'll see, lakes, mountains, beautiful flora, uh, being a Pacific nation, of course, we're preoccupied with sailing, or many of us are preoccupied with sailing, and we tend to do okay in international sailing races. Uh, beautiful flora and fauna, those are just a few of the beautiful native birds in New Zealand. Uh, so turning then a little more specifically to Māori, who uh, arrived in New Zealand largely as a result of a major migration that occurred over many years. In, in our traditional creation stories, we believe that Māori emanated or hailed initially from a place, a mythical place called Hawaiki. Uh, the archaeologists and the linguists though tell us that probably we began some 3,000 years or so BC over on the uh, eastish coast of Taiwan. And indeed, if any of you have visited Taiwan and you've had the opportunity to meet with some of the indigenous Taiwanese people, you will be stunned at how Pacific they look. I certainly was. Our major migrations came out, though, through Polynesia, uh, arriving there about sort of 700 oddish AD, and then coming through to New Zealand in or around 1300 or so AD. Uh, those voyages were on multi-hull canoes, and interestingly, interestingly in more recent times, um, sailors have actually built canoes and used traditional systems of navigation to prove, in fact, that simply using traditional navigation and the tides and the wind, it is in fact possible uh, to make those journeys. Māori, uh, like many tribal groups, are defined not as individuals but largely as a function of the natural surrounds uh, and of our connection to our ancestors and to those natural surrounds. What I've got there uh, is a picture, actually as it happens, that man is my uh, deceased father who uh, is pointing toward my spiritual home uh, and the meeting house our communal meeting house, which is situated in a little place called Makitu over on the east coast uh, of the North Island of New Zealand. And you'll see there, down in the bottom left, uh, the sea and the mountain, which is just a, uh, a different perspective. Or that's actually what my father is looking at from where he is standing. So the natural surrounds are really important, as are our connections to those that have gone before us, stemming right back into and including uh, the spirit world. And of course, like most tribes, and we were, all, we were all of us tribal at some stage, it's just a little longer ago for some of us than for others, the collective has much more importance than the individual, and collective life and the maintenance and the protection of collective life, life is paramount um, as a tribal concept. So equally is the idea of spirituality and spiritualism. In Māori, originally, Spirituality was very much seated in the natural surround and in the natural world. Of course, consequent on uh, colonisation, that's changed to take on many of the aspects of Christianity. But still, in many tribes and in many areas of New Zealand and in many of the prayers and incantations uh, that are said, there are very, very strong non-Christian pre-colonial naturalist themes. Whakapapa, the idea of genealogy, uh, and the, the importance of the way in which we are connected one to another is absolutely critical and is a very, very important part of the ritualised way in which we introduce ourselves to one another and the way in which we welcome new guests uh, in, into our amongst, amongst us. Uh, and Whakapapa begins with Ngai Atua, those are the gods, that's the spirit world. And many people can actually describe their genealogy going back to the spirit world. Um, 
and from the spirit world through those that have gone before us, including the maunga, those are the mountains, the awa, the rivers, the lakes, uh, and then the iwi, that is the tribe, the hapu, the sub-tribe, sub and ending with one's name. Now that's a sort of a bit of a turnaround to the individualization of uh, Western society, where your name is the first and most important thing about you. The concept of whanaungatanga, so that's about relatedness and connectedness, again to the natural sounds, but also to one another. And I'll explain to you in a, a bit how that is best defined. And whanaungatanga, the idea of wider family ties and responsibilities. So you can get a strong sense here of the importance of a series of increasingly larger collective groups. And with the individual within those collective groups being of much less importance than, a group itself, than the group itself. And then the idea of guardianship, um, that we are here in order to be guardians of the natural world rather than to, uh, to own it and to use it as a commodity to be sold. Um, the idea of manakitanga, which is of caring and of nurturing, and again within tribal society and in, in welcoming new people amongst us, it's a very, very important thing to be seen to be caring for them and to be uh, nurturing them among us. And principally again, of course, kotaitanga, the idea of unity, that there is strength in the whole. And of course, I imagine that that was all about successful evolution, that at some point we, all of us, realised that we were much more likely to succeed and survive if we were part of a whole than we are if we actually do it alone. Sitting underneath all of that in tribal life for Māori is this idea of tikanga. Tikanga, tika as a word means the right way, but it is a series of sort of customs and of law that emanates from our culture that defines the way in which things occur. And out of that, there are a series of roles that each of us has, and some of us can have multiple roles, uh, but that with those roles come, of course, a set of responsibilities and, uh, uh, and guiding rules, so things that one can do and things that, can't, that one can't do. Um, and again, principally, they are for the purposes of protection of the whole and of the safety of all of the elements of that whole. And for those things that are particularly important, they traditionally were given a spiritual mandate. And again, you can understand why that might be. For something that was critically important that you didn't want an individual to transgress, the best way to do that was to give it some kind of special spiritual significance. And of course, we in Māori are not the only group to have done that. So if we talk... Turn then to, so what I talked to you about there was the sort of classic, traditional Māori way of life. We lived in villages, we all of us lived collectively, we had collective places of meeting, we had a highly ritualised way in which we did that. And we were principally about the maintenance of the whole. And then in or around the late 18th century, <coughs> excuse me, we received uh, some of the earliest visitors, colonial visitors, from England, and they were largely whalers, sealers, adventurous souls, who uh, saw an opportunity to do best in a new land, uh, and that is totally to be understood. At around that time, in 1835, uh, though, the combined Māori tribes established the Declaration of Independence, and that was essentially in order to allow Māori to continue with what was a highly successful commercial trading life. Uh, shortly thereafter, though, as more and more visitors came and as more other nations, in particular the French, began to express an interest perhaps in New Zealand as a potential colonial destination, there was the establishment of the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840. So as I say, that was partly about establishing a particular relationship between the English Crown and Māori. It was partly about establishing a rule of law over the then pretty unruly English uh, traders, sealers, whalers, um, and it was also uh, about, as I say, establishing a formal relationship with the French as potential colonists sitting at the back door. The Treaty of Waitangi is a really interesting thing uh, in that it has continued to live in New Zealand uh, and around which there's, there's been a lot of active consternation, if not outright uh, conflict. Uh, and many people find it a very difficult thing because uh, 
for a range of reasons, one of them being that, of course, there were different interpretations of the wording of the treaty, because it was written both in Māori and in English. But for argument's sake, the treaty defined really three principal issues. It, 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 it required the Crown to involve Māori as equal partners in all aspects of civil and legal life. It, it, assured the protection of all of those things that are dear to Māori in terms of custom, customary rights, customary roles, customary uh, practices, and it ensured that Māori were able to participate in all aspects of civil life. At least that's what the treaty said. Uh, and that's just a depiction of the signing of the treaty back in 1840. Pretty, and, and, and history suggests that actually that was done with the best of intentions, actually. But equally, shortly thereafter, as increasing numbers of colonists came to New Zealand, increasing numbers of traders seeing the opportunity for a better life, the establishment of the New Zealand Company, the process of uh, progressive colonisation had a devastating effect on Māori. And again, there's nothing different for us from any other Indigenous people of the world in this regard. So you'll see there, whereas we were in the vast majority at or around the time of the signing, only in... 1901, you know, we were a significant minority. There was a progressive alienation of land, and again, um, you know, a, a, a classic strategy really for colonisation. You know, in the first instance by war, so there were a wide range of different wars between Crown forces and Iwi Māori, but different tribes around New Zealand where land was taken, uh, but also is a result of progressive uh, legislation that alienated or confiscated Māori land from, uh, from them. And of course, it didn't really matter what the crime was, usually uh, the sentence was the loss of land. And I think this is a lovely quote. Please uh, indulge me if I read it. This was uh, something, uh, a quote out of the Nat Native Land Court. So the Native Land Court was essentially established for the purposes of alienation of land. And in 1885, Robert Bruce, who was a then Member of Parliament, declared in Parliament that we could not devise a more ingenious method of destroying the whole of the Māori race than by these land courts. The natives come in from the villages in the interior and have to hang around for months in our centres of population. They are brought into contact with the lowest cla possible classes of society and are exposed to temptation. The result is that a great number contract our diseases uh, and die. And of course that's what happened. Language of course also was progressively undermined, um, although there's been a little bit of a resurgence in terms of the learning of uh, Māori language, and as it happens, Māori happen is one of the uh, former languages of New Zealand. As I say, there was a systematic undermining of the speaking of Māori, and it was my father uh, remembers very clearly being strapped for speaking Māori uh, in class. And as a result, of course, with the language, so too many of the customs, uh, the traditional economy, and ultimately, I would argue, the general sense of Māori identity. Now, I don't mean that this was completely destroyed, but it was certainly, for many, significantly undermined uh, as the result of colonisation. And I'm going to whip through this pretty quickly because I imagine that you could probably tell me all about how colonisation affects Indigenous people. But this is one of the things that um, is one of the shames of New Zealand. So our rate of imprisonment um, is, is shameful. And our rate of re-imprisonment is shameful. Many people don't realise and see that we uh, imprison people probably more commonly than any other nation in the world. But in particular, Māori are, are grossly overrepresented in that. And so as you see, despite being 15 or 16 odd percent of the population, we make up half of the prison population. And we have a relative risk of about 7.5 times that of non-Māori or of European New Zealanders of being, uh, of being incarcerated. Life, and sp life expectancy, so adjusted life expectancy, exactly the same thing. You know, irrespective of our social class, we can expect to live something like between 10 and 15 years uh, less than our non-Māori colleagues. So to unemployment, the unemployment rate for Māori is about three times that for non-Māori. Uh, 
And so just turning more specifically then to the mental health status of Māori, and there's been a little bit of, uh, there's been a little bit of publication around this. Um, in 2006, we um, conducted a major community-based epidemiology study looking at the high prevalence disorders. Um, and basically what we showed is, as I say, Māori suffer a significant and disproportionate level of burden of disease. Um, high levels of severity, significant comorbidity, that's comorbidity both in terms of uh, other mental health conditions but also physical conditions. Um, and yet despite that, and indeed we showed that despite having about 70, between 70 and 75 percent of the conditions that were diagnosable were of moderate to severe uh, severity. Um, only something like about 15% of us sought any degree of professional help for those problems. And alcohol and substance misuse was the one disorder of all of them that was statistically significantly higher in Māori. And that's quite important because I'll come back to that uh, in a bit. So too, for those of us uh, that do manage to access services, we have quite a different uh, experience of those services, whether that's in primary care, and there are a number of publications now showing that despite the fact that we might have a very similar condition with a very similar severity, we don't seem to access the same kind of treatments in the same sorts of ways. Uh, equally, in terms of secondary care services, we uh, have a disproportionate level uh, of institutionalisation, not just in prisons, but also in forensic mental health uh, institutions and in adult inpatient psychiatric units. So uh, I am the director currently of a you know, mid-sized uh, mental health service. We have 750 odd staff. Um, and we have a forensic mental health service that has, at the moment, about 70% of the people in that service are of Māori ethnicity. And in our adult inpatient unit, a little less than that. So again, significant disproportionate representation. Um, I and some others also showed that Māori have between two and three times the relative risk of being diagnosed with schizophrenia or with a major depressive disorder in a secondary mental health service uh, in New Zealand. And we've also made the argument, particularly in the case of schizophrenia, that we believe that there's a very strong association and indeed, we're interested in having an argument with anybody that would like to disagree with us um, about the fact that we think increasingly there may even be a causative link, particularly between the use of synthetic agents and methamphetamine and our increasing levels uh, of schizophrenia. But again, you know, co we have much more experience of coercive care, so we don't, as I said to you before, we don't tend to access mental health and addiction services as a result of referrals by GPs, we tend to be bought by the police or referred by the courts. High levels of seclusion, of victimisation, um, of being both the victims and the perpetrators, uh, and of compulsory care. And we also have different experiences of the use of antipsychotics. So, moving on then to the because this is all basically building a background for you as to why it is that we ought to think about doing a slightly different thing, approaching the treatment and rehabilitation of this particular group in a slightly different way. Uh, and the case for change, I think, can be argued on the basis of two things. Firstly, the obvious need. And I think it's really hard, you've got to be blind, not to see the obvious need. The disproportionate burden of mental illness and the rates of incarceration and criminalisation, and they're getting worse. Um, and the increasing marginalisation of Māori from mainstream society and the tendency for many Māori to seek other ways of being associated with one another, the vast majority of which are actually quite antisocial. And the idea, and I know uh, that it's trite, but the idea that if we don't do something different, we can hardly expect that things are going to change. And then there's a right-based argument that essentially comes out of um, the right that Māori believe that they have under the Treaty of Waitangi to protect the things that they hold dear, to, be, to actively participate as partners in the provision of care and treatment for their people. So the underlying premise for this new way essentially uh, acknowledges three main challenges. So firstly, 
that whilst cultural, a cultural approach is important, it's also important to acknowledge and to respect the best practice provision of psychiatric treatment and rehabilitation. And when I say psychiatric, by the way, I mean in the broadest possible sense, involving all disciplines, all of the approaches that we know work. Uh, they're necessary, I would argue, but they're not sufficient. They're clearly not sufficient. Because I think equally, we have to look at ways of providing those services that better engage Māori and offer opportunities for a pro-social collective identity, opportunities for people to see themselves as other than people who are likely to just be offenders, to give people hope, I guess. And then the third thing, and I think that the concept for me, the concepts for me of reciprocity and of empathy are issues that are critically important in terms of forensic rehabilitation. So once we've treated somebody's illness, once we've basically improved their skills, the challenge of helping them to understand the concepts of reciprocity and, and collectivity and the responsibility that comes with that and the development of empathy are effectively what we're all about, I think. There have been some earlier uh, attempts in New Zealand through the late 1900s to do this, but largely they, uh, if we look back at them, were complicated by the fact that although there were Māori approaches and there were psychiatric or medical approaches, they were never particularly integrated and they often would conflict one with the other, causing problems. So the model that we had in principle uh, really acknowledged the importance of those three things, that is our Māori cultural approach, the importance of best practice clinical approach, and of course, particularly given the population that we're talking about, the idea of safety and you know, the partner of safety being security, also being an imperative that requires to be considered, be considered equally between the three. Um, it was really important if we were going to have a model that was culturally imbued, that the local people, the local tribal people accepted that, owned that, and felt that they had the ability to define what that looked like and hold us to account for that. Uh, and a model of care, as I say, that was able to manage those imperatives equally at any given time. Now that sounds like an easy thing to say, but it's not always that easy. I was just talking to Anne earlier about um, when those three imperatives conflict, because it is doctors or mental health professionals that are usually in charge, it is usually the medical or the mental health imperative that wins out. Even when, commonly, it's not the most important. And in the long term, it may not bring the best benefit or gain. Um, and wider organisational mandate and support is very, very important because we were providing this within a mainstream forensic mental health service, that the organisation had to maintain uh, support for that approach because, of course, as we all know, as soon as there any, is any compromise to that, then there is no point in continuing to do it. Um, and that what we realised was critical was that the leaders of the service had to be duly competent, so they had to themselves have a very clear sense of the importance of those three imperatives and have a degree of competence in all of them. They needed to be good clinicians, they needed to actually understand uh, Māori cultural law, L-O-R-E, and they also had to have a sense of the importance of safety and of security. And so too, of course, all of the staff working in the unit needed to have a degree of competence uh, as well. And one of the really important challenges was in getting mental health services and mental health professionals to accept the validity and the importance uh, of komatua, that is the older male cultural experts, the people who hold the traditional knowledge, cultural knowledge, the queer, that's the older women who hold very many of the same sorts of roles, and the cultural workers who are involved in a range of different interventions. That was an interesting challenge to get people to accept them as equal members of the multidisciplinary team with valid, uh, with valid contributions to multidisciplinary discussions. And so I don't propose to go through those because you might remember I talked a little bit about them when I was talking about traditional tribal societies. Suffice to say that fundamentally this was a model whose principles and values were seated very firmly in the, in the Māori world. And so where a collectivity and a collective sense of wellness, a collective sense of, of, of identity, were principally important. And when I say that, I mean that not just for the patient group, but also for the staff. 
So many of the programs that were done were programs that we had the explicit expectation that staff would also attend, which is quite an interesting challenge. Uh, and in practice, you know, as I said, it was important that the tribal groups, tribal elders, uh, agreed and supported, and they did, and that it was important for them to be involved in every aspect of the development of that model. So it was not sufficient just to have a little bit of a chat at the front end and get everybody to agree and then, you know, basically forge on ahead without them, but to have them involved, actively involved, at, at every level. Uh, then there was the appointment of a Māori psychiatrist, yours truly, and uh, a Māori unit manager who was absolutely critical he was absolutely critical to the running of this unit and uh, it remains in the service today. And then there were the, the appointment of the cultural experts, uh, some of which were on staff, some of which we engaged from local Māori on a contract basis, um, providing language programs, cultural uh, programs, kapa haka, which is, some of you may have seen the haka at the beginning of the, uh, do, do, how many of you know what a haka is? Okay, so some of you have seen it at the beginning of a all-black uh, uh, rugby game, but um, of carving, of weaving, and of traditional traditional health practices that is wrong. Um, and the other thing is tailoring some of the clinical interventions. So as I said to you, we prided ourselves in the provision of pretty high-class, we think, um, clinical interventions, but they required just a little bit of tailoring for that particular environment. So CBT, some of the violence prevention programs, we used Man Alive, some of you may know the Man Alive program out of North America, but it required just a little bit of uh, melding for the Māori environment. Uh, also though for some of the social, occupational and psychological programs that we ran. Um, and we had a predominantly Māori clinical staff, although of course we were not able to always staff uh, the program only with Māori, but it was pretty clear that for those Māori who weren't involved, they were required, they were required to uh, agree to and act in a manner which reflected the fact that they also honoured the principles of the unit. And that was really, really important. So we did actually have several occasions in which we had to actually have a chat to staff about the extent to which perhaps their behaviour wasn't necessarily reflecting those principles. Just as an aside, um, it was probably one of, for me anyway, and I've run a reasonable number of services, it, it, it was one of the most successful experiences of establishing some values and some principles and a way of being and therefore acting in a service that I think I've ever had. And it, and it, and it provided some of the best opportunities to hold people to account for that. Because of course they were collectively accountable. They weren't just collect they weren't just accountable to me as the director. They were accountable to everybody else in the community, who were quite happy to point out when they weren't actually acting consistent with the values. Can I tell you? Uh, and so the the program's called Tani Fakapiripiri. It's a um, 15 bed rehab unit uh, inside of the Auckland Regional Forensic Mental Health Service. It was a purpose built facility, and I'll talk to you in a minute about the issue of building facilities and the extent to which they can support a model of care. That, that we think projects the model of care and best supports the model of care. Uh, admissions at that stage, things have changed a little bit now, but admissions, or will change soon, uh, were from the mainstream acute subacute services, uh, and they were admitted on the basis of a series of selection criteria and an interview process. Um, and so there was a degree of choice, but we also had situations in which uh, we would see someone they would not want to be a part of the program, but they so clearly needed to be a part of the program that we effectively made the choice for them. Uh, and I can tell you that not one single one of them, subsequently not, single, not one single one of them left the program or wanted to, to leave the program. And actually, you know, if I reflect on it, some of them were the people who did best in it, actually. Uh, and there was obviously early, early objective assessments of mental state and of general functioning uh, of the preparedness to undertake some of the rehab programs because it's a very, very intensive rehab program, obviously of risk, and of the extent to which one has a consolidated pro-social uh, identity. Just talk a little bit about facilities so that you know, we all know about the conundrum of uh, form and function. We had one of the, you know, possibly one of the 
few opportunities that I think I've ever had to think about a model of care before the building of a unit. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but we're much more used to having to provide services out of a building that someone else didn't want, um, which makes uh, fashioning a, a, a facility that supports your model of care that much more difficult. Um, and so the facility did need to have a connection to nature and to the natural surrounds in terms of the materials, the design, the orientation to the sun and to the nat natural surrounds. Um, it, it, ought, it needed to provide opportunities for the cultural processes and interventions. So the whare, the whare being the communal meeting place where all important processes occur. And I'll show you a photo of that in a minute. Um, collective dining. So not only did the patient group eat together, but so did a significant number of the staff. So eating occurred in a truly collective manner. Um, but there also needed to be uh, opportunities for people when families visit, Fano, that's families visited, to be with their families, uh, and to do other kōkiri as the physical uh, therapy spaces uh, as well. It also needed to allow a separation between the personal spaces versus the, the, the spaces and places where people were to be together versus those spaces that were about work, that were about therapy. And because uh, it was a unit that has both men and women, it required, of course, a place that uh, women could be without um, men. So that's, uh, now do I have a, actually I was going to point the pointer at that, but you won't see it, will you? Um, down in the bottom left, so that is the Mason Clinic, that's York and Regional Forensic Psychiatry Service. And down in the bottom left there, this is an old photograph, things have changed a bit since this photo was taken, but is you see the green roofs. That's the, 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 the cultural area, the cultural space where Tani Whakapiripiri is. So I'll show you a couple of shots now of some of the ways in which some of those principles I described uh, have been incorporated. So just new and different ways of doing security fencing with an incorporation of uh, native planting, native gardens. That, that's the unit, so you'll see there, that's the courtyard down here, the bottom shot, and you'll see there the water feature with the kōhatu, the rock, and there's a particular significance about that rock from where it came and the significance of it for the community. And you'll see that the rest of the service basically is in a semicircle or a circle around that central courtyard. Uh, and you remember I said there was a whare, so this is the you remember I showed you the photograph at the beginning with my father standing outside of our uh, spiritual home, our what you call the whare nui. So this is the one for the service, and this is the first bit, this is the front facing element. This is the place where visitors are welcomed, this is the place where all of the key uh, cultural and many of the key clinical activities occur. So I held my multidisciplinary meetings in this whare, and there would often be families and others all involved in the ward round in the multidisciplinary meeting, and everybody participating, which was both a rich and at times somewhat frustrating process. Uh, and this is the, what we call a central pole. So in the middle there's a central pole that holds up, um, that holds up the whare. And this is a, a, a woman, Hinea Tuaru, who um, had a particular and significant caring role. So it was an opportunity to tell people about, she came from that area, I'm not from that area by the way. She came from that area and it was an opportunity to engage people around her history and about what she did for her people. And there were lots and lots of opportunities, particularly for the women actually, but also for some of the men, opportunities to actually just gather around here when people were distressed and to use her story largely as a mechanism for soothing and engaging distressed people. Uh, and then these are just a couple of shots of the extent to which artworks and the kind of uh, superficial surrounds can again reflect aspects uh, of culture. So you'll see the designs in there, I imagine a number of you have seen those sorts of patterns. And then as I say, other little areas that have got really important Māori artefacts in or around them where people can do particular things. So you'll see there's a piece of greenstone over on a piece of carving that one of the 
uh, one of the service users carved. And that, that's a particular area in which one of the cultural workers uh, did a, one of the cultural workers who worked with the women actually did uh, a particular set of interventions. Uh, and that is, uh, so that was carved jointly by a group of the staff. So these are staff that are not carvers, these are nurses, occupational therapists, psychologists and the like, um, and service users. Um, and that will go up in one of the other buildings uh, that I'll tell you about uh, in a bit. But the process of doing that together, the process of clinical staff doing that with patients is something really um, that has quite a spiritual significance to it and is actually a really interesting way of engaging because the things you talk about while you're bashing away on a piece of wood are quite interesting. They tell you a lot about people. So I thought that I'd just briefly whip through and try and give you some sense of what all of this means for a particular patient. Uh, and obviously this is a stylized patient, but, but, a, but a pretty common story, and I imagine a pretty common story for many of you, a pretty common picture for many of you. Uh, so a fellow in his 20s, uh, schizophrenia with chronic psychosis, uh, you know, and the, the list. <laughs> But most importantly, he identified as Māori, but really had very little knowledge or understanding of what that meant. And, and, and in fact, when I explored that, what he really identified himself as in saying that he was Māori is that he identified himself as being something other than the system. So that was just a way of defining himself as other than the system. He, he had really very little idea of his cultural heritage, he had very little idea of the things that had gone uh, on his own history, his tribal history, and the significance uh, you know, of that for, for his life. Uh, and so, of course, that, that was a really important part of engaging him and, and providing him with treatment and with therapy. So the first thing was actually about engaging with him, because one of the really nice things about whanaungatanga, as I told you before, is that the explicit expectation is that we will engage, so the conversation that we will have is a conversation that continues until we can find a particular point of, con of, of commonality. So that might be somebody that we actually have in our whakapapa, but that might actually be we're related somewhere, albeit, you know, five, ten more generations back. Um, or it might be through marriage, or it might be you know, that, that your ancestors fought with my ancestors in a particular war. But the idea is that we're looking for a common connection. And that's a common connection between me, the doctor, and you, the patient. Um, that's got nothing to do with medicine, it's got nothing to do with your offending, it's got nothing to do with where you are. But it's a very powerful way of establishing a relationship uh, with someone. And it's about making whanaungatanga real, as I say. And you've got to be able to, as a therapist, as a mental health professional, you've got to be able to give over quite a lot of yourself in order to do that, which again is quite a challenge to many of the, you know, to many of the traditional mental health disciplines. Obviously a full assessment, not just of your clinical strengths and weaknesses, but also actually of your, of, of your cultural weaknesses. For him, the maximisation of his pharmacological treatment. So he came in pretty well. We required a little bit of tr the tweaking of his medication and we leveraged largely off the engagement we had as a result of the cultural process to begin to have some conversations around his medication. So some of those, you know, some of the justification went something like, well, you know, you'd like to be able to be better at kapahaka, at doing the haka, but you're not able to be able to do that because, you know, you've got this tart of dyskinesia or you've got this tart of, it was a tart of akathisia actually in his, his case. And interestingly, actually, that allowed us an opportunity to talk to him about a different medication, whereas others had tried to engage him and have a conversation just, you know, about the efficacy and the side effects of the medication, and they were unsuccessful. Um, and then to customise some of the individual treatments, and again, some of those are about the traditional psychiatric treatments, therapies, and some of those are about, you know, cultural, uh, cultural treatments or therapies uh, as well. And then engaging around some common goals and helping them to understand that some of those goals are about a better understanding of, of his culture and himself and the opportunity to redefine himself in many ways as someone with a pro-social identity. And, and some of that actually really is about giving hope. It's an opportunity to use that process to give people hope where maybe they didn't have any hope that things were going to change. Maybe they didn't, you know, all they saw was, 
all they saw before them is what they'd seen for their father and their cousins and everybody around them. And actually, this is a really good example of someone who um, actually had quite a lot of antisociality around him. And so actually trying to find a role model in his family that he could engage with uh, was quite tricky and quite difficult. Uh, notwithstanding that, we did involve his family because, of course, albeit they somewhat antisocial, they're still a really important part uh, of his life. Uh, and he then became involved in our Māori milieu. And if I give you just perhaps a, a classic day was a day in which you know everybody woke. They usually woke reasonably early, uh, at about seven. And then there was a Māori exercise program at the beginning. So there's a series of Māori exercises that are um, that are, are quite traditional. So people would start with that. Then everybody would eat breakfast. And then there would be a fully organised programme of activities. So there'd be some part of the day where individuals could do the things that individuals need to do. So somebody, you know, there might have been a CBT group or somebody needed to go off and do some occupational therapy. Or, and then there were a series of collective activities as well. So kapaka, everybody would... And when I say everybody, again, I'm talking about staff and patients alike. Everybody would come together in the, uh, in the whare and there would be kapahaka, so, so one of the cultural workers would come in and we would learn a particular song. And most of the songs, of course, described historical events or were based on historical events or important aspects uh, of history. And everybody would be involved in that. The expectation is that everybody was involved in that. And again, you know, there's something quite intimate and engaging uh, about singing shoulder to shoulder with another person, whether you're singing Māori songs or any other songs, frankly. Uh, and then, you know, the day would go on, we'd stop for lunch, everybody would eat together. And although I had a busy day, I would try and make a point of being there and eating with the whanau as well. Uh, and, you know, there was, a, there was a, a rule that during meal breaks, so during times when we weren't in therapy, we wouldn't be talking about therapeutic things. So that would be a time in which we were just yakking about everything and anything. Uh, and as I say, you know, it provided, not only did it provide the opportunity for the establishment of, you know, st a strong pro-social sense of identity, but it also, uh, it also provided the opportunity to leverage of some of that engagement for a wide range of other uh, medical and psychiatric tasks. Uh, also an opportunity to building knowledge and skills toward a pro-social identity. So it was really interesting to watch this guy. And we only, of course, we only have people, you know, whilst from a mental health perspective, it's quite a long time. Uh, we only have people in our forensic mental health setting in an inpatient service for anything up to a couple of years in the vast majority of cases. And in terms of, you know, that challenge I identified earlier of helping people to develop a degree of reciprocity, to engage in and understand and develop a sense of empathy, which is essentially attempting to try and make some change in their personality and personality function, that's not a hell of a lot of time. Um, but uh, he did really, really well in that regard. He did really, really well. And, he, you know, what he was provided with, I think, is the template on which he could continue with that once he was discharged. Um, and there were repeated opportunities to actually, uh, repeated opportunities to reinforce the role that he had. And he had a number of different traditional roles in quite a number of the rituals. And it was wonderful to see him go from at the beginning being quite detached, being a little bit psychotic on and off, uh, and not being involved in programs, through to within a year or so being in the program, he was actually. He was the guy that in the major welcoming ritual, he was the guy that did the beginning prayer, um, which is a really important role in that major protocol. And he would do that in front of you know, 50 gathered people, the vast majority of whom he didn't know, which was an incredible shift for him. Uh, on the other thing, incidentally, that was quite useful was I, I told you before about the antisociality of his immediate family, one of the great things that culture and history provides is the opportunity to use the stories from his history as a means of getting him to try and engage with uh, and to, to identify with someone in, his, sorry, someone in his past, some important figure in his past. And as we went into that latter part where he began, to take, he began to take on a bit of a leadership role, that was critically important. And you could really see him starting to identify with this figure 
uh, from his past. And again, you know, what that builds is a collective sense of accountability in the community. So we also had uh, a process where, you know, if there were problems in the community, they were sorted out in the community in the classic kind of milieu way. Uh, so involvement in um, nature and carving and gardening, again, there's something incredibly therapeutic about actually having the soil between your fingers and in growing something. And you know, one of the stunning things for me was this is a man who had never been a part of growing anything in his life. And in fact, there was a point at which he acknowledged that he really had never been a part, in fact, of, pos of contributing positively to something that grew or uh, at, at any stage in his life. So it was, you know, he became quite protective actually about so silly little things like silver beet. Silver beet's beet, I imagine you call it here. Um, and all of that was about basically uh, helping him to gain a perspective on the future, helping him to gain or develop a sense of trust, and helping him to see that maybe there's an opportunity for him to change, you know, his life. Um, outcomes measurement is really, really important I mean, uh, and, and clearly something that we need to do. So in this program, um, we have a classic suite of outcome measures, as you'll see. I think they're the standard ones that most of you would, would, would have as variations in your service. The one uh, outcome measure, though, that we have struggled with is to develop a valid and reliable uh, way of, uh, of gauging the development of a pro-social cultural identity. Um, but we're continuing to work uh, on that. So what are the challenges? Because I think this program has thrown up quite a lot of challenges, and some of you may already have seen those. I mean challenges to the traditional way in which we approach forensic psychiatric treatment and rehabilitation. Um, you know, the idea of collectivism versus separatism. So. I think one of the things that we do all too often in forensic mental health services, mental health services in general actually, is see patient groups as other and treat them constantly as other. And, and I believe that it's difficult to engage with people in a meaningful way if they are aware that they are being treated as other. And so I do think that whatever the way is, we have to find other ways of engaging people and that can be quite you know, that can be quite challenging because, of course, for many of us as therapists, when we uh, did our training, one of the things that we were taught to do was to maintain a boundary between ourselves and our patients. Uh, and, you know, when you're working in a cultural paradigm where um, the ultimate indication of meeting and coming together, having gone through the, the, the process of negotiating safety, is the hungi. Some of you may have seen the hungi. That's the touching of noses. So in the welcoming process, there is a negotiation of time and of space where visitors begin a long way away, visitors are called in to get closer, and there's a process in the calling of deciding and determining whether you're coming, uh, whether you're coming as friends or as foe. And then there are a series of formalised speeches. And then at the end of that, when it's clear that you are friends, there's a thing called the haruru, where all of the guests, one by one, will go around and they will touch noses with, uh, with the home group. And having done that, they then become part of the home group. So if it happens later in the day that some other visitors come in, you are part of the home group. So you can imagine, if you're touching noses with people on a daily basis, that does present a little bit of a challenge to the idea of having boundaries in therapy. <laughs> Uh, and the balancing of the paradigms in any decision, because I said to you before, you know, one of the challenges previously is if you've got a unit that's basically, uh, that's, that's basically led by, and where all of the power is vested in a cultural interest, then everything becomes cultural. Everything becomes cultural. And of course, when that happens, you're going to miss a whole lot of crucially important clinical things that are required to be addressed. But equally and more frequently, I think, when you've got an initiative, when you've got a service that's led by psychiatrists, by psychologists, by clinical people, everything becomes a clinical thing. And unless you've really got a sense of and a degree of competence in both imperatives, it's really hard to make the right decision about that at the right time, I believe. Uh, and prioritising therapy, you know, over some of those other things like safety and like security, and I know that we all of us actually, that's a challenge for all of us in our services. And the issue of 
and the significance for workforce development because as you can see as I've described some of the expectations on staff, some of the competencies that are required of staff, that does also require that you have a particular approach to the development uh, and the support of your workforce. And so what are the learnings? Um, I mean as I said to you before, we picked people up after they'd really had their acute and secure treatment and then we released people at the door. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, that's only one bit of their pathway. Ultimately what we would want to have is a completely integrated parallel stream. Uh, and I know that uh, under the leadership of, of Jeremy Skipworth, the service in my absence is now moving quite quickly to the point where they will be able to have that. So they'll have elements of this program at every level throughout that pathway. So in prison, in acute and secure care, in rehab, and then with the capacity to release people into the community where they continue to have these things reinforced. But as you might imagine, that's a, that's a pretty big commitment. Um, codifying cultural inputs. So again, you know, from a traditional perspective, that's an anathema, that's the devil incarnate. The idea that I might want to try and objectify some measure of what, you know, what a good cultural intervention might be and or what a good outcome from a cultural intervention might be. And that's a challenge. Um, and it's one of the biggest challenges, as I say, about outcomes measurement. When, when we first started this project, I had this fantasy that we might be able to look, you know, we might be able to develop a valid and reliable cultural indicator, and that what we could do is actually have a look across all of the outcome domains. And my fantasy was that as we saw a stronger and stronger development of a pro-social sense of cultural identity, we'd equally see the HCR or the Dundrum come down and, and people's general functioning go up. I still believe that we can show that, but we have some challenges, I said, around actually codifying and developing outcomes measures for, uh, for some of our cultural programs. Um, and then the issue of choice, you know, I mean, who, who doesn't, doesn't get choice? And ultimately, actually, and Jeremy and I were talking about this yesterday, ultimately, I would really love to do a completely randomised outcome study where we randomised people right at the front end to one or other pathway and see what the difference is. Um, and so I really hope that at some stage you might invite me back to talk about those outcomes and I do apologise that I'm not able to tell you about them now but suffice to say uh, that on the nature of having worked in that unit for I don't know how many years it was, maybe between three and five years and having seen something like about I don't know, 25 people go through that unit over that time and having seen the change in those individuals and the relationships that they were able to have with their kids, with their families and with the world, uh, I do genuinely believe that uh, there are some learnings for mainstream for forensic mental health services from, from traditional knowledge systems and traditional you know, ways of living and approaching the world. So thanks very much. That's me. I'm happy to take some questions.